So good afternoon, everyone. Um, I am Ivo Siegmann. Welcome to the Northwest Seminar Series of Mathematical Biology and Data Science. This seminar series is co-organized by the universities of Liverpool and Manchester and Liverpool John Moores University. And this week, the seminar is hosted by Liverpool John Moores University. It will be presented by Dr. Lynn Govert from the Leibniz Institute of Freshwater Ecology and Inland Fisheries in Berlin or short IGB, I think. Um, first, I would like to say a few words about our upcoming talks. So next week on Monday at the unusual time, because the speaker is in the US, so at 4 p.m., we will have a talk by Dr. Manu Setti from the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Center. And um, on Wednesday at 2 p.m., Dr. Jen Kreese from the University of Exeter will give a talk. And then we are actually already off for the Easter break, so make sure that you don't miss these two talks. Um, I would now like to introduce um, today's speakers. So uh, when I asked Lynn if she could tell me a bit about herself, she said, I'm a mathematician with a PhD in biology, and I guess that's exactly right. Lynn uh, studied mathematics at the University of Leuven in Belgium and completed both her bachelor and master's degree there. And then I think you worked uh, first towards becoming a maths teacher and um, you did a specific training course for maths uh, teaching in Belgium. But then um, you took on a PhD with Luc de Mester at the University of Leuven and um, you were able to fund your PhD via a PhD uh, fellowship from the Flanders um, state in, in Belgium. Um, as a PhD student, um, you visited quite famous ecologists. I was really impressed. So for example, um, Nelson Hairston at Cornell University. And um, after uh, your PhD, you joined the group of Florian Altermatt um, at the EAVAC in Zurich as a postdoc. Now I think um, you have just moved to Berlin. So um, I think the last time we spoke, maybe two weeks ago or so, you um, were just about to move to Berlin. And um, yeah, you're now at the Leibniz Institute of Freshwater Ecology and Inland Fisheries. Um, it's close to a lake, isn't it? Mm -hmm. This Muggelsee. Yeah, I think a friend of mine worked there and she liked it quite a lot. Um, so um, you have just taken on a position as a junior research group leader, I think, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I look forward to your talk on eco-evolutionary dynamics, um, concepts and metrics. Yes, thank you. So thank you, Ivo, for the very nice introduction. Um, also, um, I would like to thank the organizer for giving me the opportunity to basically present my work here. So my name is Lynn, and today I will basically present you a bit more on eco-evolutionary dynamic concepts and metrics um, towards a multi-species perspectives. So basically, the main goal of my research is to understand how trade changes and trade variation affect community structure and functioning of ecosystems in time and space. And so I particularly focus on freshwater ecosystems, but the metrics and uh, the models I develop are basically intended to be generally applicable. And then more specifically, I'm interested in quantifying the contributions of ecological and evolutionary processes in shaping communities and meta communities and their response to environmental change. And so to obtain my research goal, I basically use uh, an array of different approaches. So on the one hand, I develop partitioning metrics to quantify the underlying ecological and evolutionary processes. I also develop conceptual frameworks and will develop corresponding theoretical models. And then I also often engage in um, experiments and data analysis of existing data sets. So first of all, um, what is eco-evolutionary dynamics? So eco-evolutionary dynamics is basically this idea that ecological and evolutionary um, processes can occur on similar timescales and hence can interact. And so traits are often very central in eco-evolutionary dynamics because on the one hand, traits can evolve and on the other hand, traits are also linked to ecological interactions. And so as traits evolve, they can basically alter ecological interactions. And so the central position of traits is also um, nicely depicted by the central position of phenotypes in this um, scheme introduced by Andrew Hendry. And so this scheme really illustrates this evo to eco pathway and the evo to eco pathway in which ecological changes basically select for specific phenotypes. 
If this phenotypic variation is heritable or partly heritable, it can result in genetic changes. These genetic changes basically um, alter back your phenotypes, and then this can feed back on um, ecological properties. And so a main stimulant of eco-evolutionary dynamics is really um, this evidence of rapid evolution. And so a well-known example on rapid evolution is um, given by the Darwin finches at Galapagos Island, where they basically found a very uh, rapid evolutionary change in the beak shape of one of the species um, in response to a change in the fraction or in the change in the fraction of large seeds at the island. And so then uh, follow-up studies have also demonstrated that rapid evolution can basically alter um, ecological dynamics. And so one of the studies of Yoshida basically showed um, in this predator-prey um, system that when they used uh, monoclonal prey populations, and so when evolution is not possible, they get the classical one-fourth um, lag phase dynamics, while um, when they use a multi-clonal prey population where um, evolution is possible, they basically get this anti-oscillation dynamics. And so this um, study basically illustrates that um, rapid evolution in the prey population can basically alter ecological predator-prey dynamics. To just give to give also uh, another example is this study um, together with Lindsay Schaffner and um, Nelson Harston. And so here we looked at the consumer resource um, dynamic system of zooplankton and phytoplankton. And so basically the main message in this study is that we found rapid evolution of the consumer species in a response to a change in the resource quality. And this rapid evolution then basically fed back on the population dynamics of the consumer species. And so what we basically could show is when, um, when we calculated how population dynamics would change when no evolution would occur um, in response to the resource, then basically we observed that only 25% of the consumer um, population would be retained by the end of the season. So here evolution really has a massive effect on uh, the consumer population densities. And as a very last example, I would like to highlight the study of Jelena Pantel, Cathy Dubivier, and Luc de Meester. So what they did is they used a natural Daphnia magna populations, which they used in a selection experiment under uh, four different ecological environments. So the absence and presence of fish or the absence and presence of microphytes. And then after the selection experiment, they basically used both adapted as well as non-adapted Daphnia magna populations. And, um, place them back in these four um, ecological environments. And so what they found is when they used adapted Daphnia magna populations, basically the density of the populations were larger, but they also found that um, this um, adaptation to the ecological environment also impacted uh, community properties such as the community structure. And more what they found is that the effect of evolution versus the effect of the ecological environment was equally large, but opposite in uh, effect. And so um, most of the studies on eco-evolutionary dynamics basically focus on um, evolutionary responses in single species and evaluate how this influences population community ecosystem properties. So one main goal of my research is really moving towards a multi-species perspective of eco-evolutionary dynamics. And so this is highly relevant because um, all species are basically embedded within communities. And I have also shown that um, species respond to species interactions. So basically, I showed you this study of Yoshida, where they um, showed rapid evolution in response to predation. But other studies, like the study of Simon Hart, have also shown rapid evolution in response to competition. And so here they use basically two aquatic plant species. Um, and they had um, a competition experiment where in one treatment they let the species just compete and evolve to each other, while in the other treatment they basically replaced each time the species with the ancestor population and therefore um, blocking evolution. And so they found rapid or they found effects of um, the rapid evolution in response to competition. Now, a recent study by Tess Granger also basically showed that species interactions can alter a species response to environmental change. And so basically this study looked at Drosophila populations um, without interspecific competition and with interspecific competition. And then they found that basically um, how this Drosophila populations with this um, 
competition history basically differed in their response to um, environmental conditions in fall. And then very last, um, studies have also shown that the magnitude and sign of species interactions often depends on the presence of other species. And basically that the presence of third species can alter strength and direction of selection in two species communities. And so this means that these last two points basically also um, show or make the um, notion that we basically cannot um, use two species communities to make predictions about um, more than two species communities. So there's really this need to move um, towards um, more than two species um, perspective in eco-evolutionary dynamics. And so how I started from um, this multi-species perspective, so I really started back from um, the basics of evolutionary biology and community ecology. And so this is also in collaboration with um, Mark Urban. And so basically um, evolutionary biologists as well as community ecologists, they are interested in the composition and diversity of specific entities and how they vary across space and time. And so for evolutionary biologists, this is basically genetic composition and genetic diversity, while for community ecologists, this is species composition and diversity. And so evolution um, is quantified as a change in allele frequencies, while co community ecology often looks at changes in species abundances. And so these units basically differ in their focus on proportional versus absolute measures, but they basically both relate to diversity. And so what we also know is that evolution can basically be described by these four fundamental processes, selection, genetic drift, gene flow, and mutation. And also more recently, community ecology has been organized along uh, four analogs. So selection, ecological drift, dispersal, and speciation. And this has been very nicely synthesized in this book of Mark Fallant on the theory of ecological communities. And so now I want to basically make um, two notes on two of um, the processes. So the first one is selection. So this is basically a deterministic process by which individuals perform differently in a specific environment. And so at the community level, this basically results in uh, changes in the relative abundances of species, which we will basically refer to as the process of species sorting. So in the next of the talk, um, I will basically refer to this um, process um, as species sorting rather than uh, selection. And then a second uh, process I want to highlight is basically mutation and speciation. And so these are the processes that create new genetic variants or species in situ. And so they basically differ from the other processes that more reshuffle existing um, variation. Then also speciation often occurs much lower than mutation, but um, there's also been examples of rapid ecological speciation. And then mutations are basically a molecular process while speciation is ultimately an evolutionary process. However, because it results in the addition of a species to the community, we see it as a community analog of mutation. And so it's basically these um, four fundamental processes of evolutionary biology and community ecology that generate and alter genetic and species diversity. But it's also these um, fundamental processes that can basically occur on similar timescales and can therefore um, also potentially interact and simultaneously structure or govern um, eco-evolutionary dynamics in a multi-species setting. And so in this sense, we could basically use these four fundamental processes to start um, generating a more mechanistic understanding of eco-evolutionary dynamics in multi-species systems. And so we could also envision this as the 16 element um, matrix, where we then could really start um, evaluating interactions between specific processes. So one could either look at um, specific pairwise interactions between these fundamental processes, but of course, one could also look at um, subsets of these processes. And so just to give you an example, of an interaction so between selection and species sorting. So this study by Stinchcomb and Rauscher basically used the ivy leaf morning glory where they um, altered the densities of insect herbivores and fungal pathogens. And what they could show is that um, without uh, or with in the absence and in the presence of insects that this altered the tolerance to deer herbivory on the ivy leaf morning glory. Basically showing that species interactions and community composition can change selection. 
but also the other way around. If you imagine uh, two species with a trait distribution and this trait is linked to a competitive ability, then either divergence or convergence in these trait distributions might change the competitive interactions between the species and therefore alter species sorting. And so showing an effect of selection on species sorting. In addition, we can actually also use um, already existing frameworks that include sets or subsets of interactions between fundamental processes. And so one of these frameworks is this evolving meta community that basically focuses on the integration of local species sorting and selection and regional dispersal and gene flow to, be, to understand ecological and evolutionary dynamics. And so basically by evaluating, um, by evaluating which um, processes or which processes existing frameworks already take into account, we might be able to um, evaluate unexplored um, directions of um, or between these interactions. And so an example of such an unexplored direction is basically the effect between ecological drift and genetic drift. And so we could already use information on existing, um, on existing frameworks or on existing um, theories that, um, that can give us expectations on, on these interactions. For example, we could expect a stronger interaction between genetic and ecological drift within, when species within the community have small population sizes, but also when the overall community size is small. And this could occur um, at initial stages of evolutionary or community rescue. But we could also um, look at how genetic drift could impact each of the um, ecological processes. And here again, we might expect that this impact is larger when species have small population sizes. We could also evaluate how each of these evolutionary processes would impact ecological drift. And this could be um, an evolutionary processes um, that basically reduce the community size. Here we might um, expect a larger impact of ecological drift. Okay, so then other questions we might be um, starting to ask is basically do specific interactions between this evolutionary and community processes result in similar eco evolutionary community dynamics and how predictable are eco evolutionary community dynamics based on these interactions between evolutionary and community processes. And so here I highlight similar and predictable, because this also raises the question, when are two eco-evolutionary dynamics similar? How should we compare eco-evolutionary dynamics? And so one can think of maybe if um, they have a similar community composition or um, genetic composition, and I lost my mouse, yeah. Similar community composition or similar genetic composition at specific time points. Do they have similar temporal dynamics? Do they have a similar community function, although they differ in the species they have? So what do we actually mean with similar? When are these dynamics similar? And so just to highlight one uh, point, so similar temporal dynamics, there has been this recent study of Rio et al on basic principles of temporal dynamics. And here they basically um, gave an overview of different types, characteristics, and patterns one could see in temporal dynamics. And so this could be a very first step in basically using um, this overview to then start comparing eco-evolutionary dynamics um, between different systems. Now, a third question we can start asking is how relatively important are evolutionary and community processes to eco-evolutionary community dynamics? And so in this case, we could start using theoretical models where we basically include or exclude um, these evolutionary and community processes and see how they um, influence eco-evolutionary community dynamics. We could do the same in controlled um, experiments. And here also, um, we could develop eco-evolutionary partitioning metrics that can basically allow us to um, specifically quantify the relative importance of these processes. And so what I want to do in the, the next part of my talk is basically highlight um, these eco-evolutionary partitioning metrics. So these metrics are um, basically developed from this um, conceptual framework, the eco-evolutionary sandwich, which basically um, quantifies or highlights the different ecological and evolutionary processes that might contribute to community trade change. 
And so here we have our evolutionary trade change at the intermediate level, which is basically sandwiched between two non-evolutionary processes. We have our species sorting um, changes in relative abundances of species at the community level, and we have our phenotypic plasticity at the individual level. However, this is still a very um, simplified picture. So it also highlights that we need to take eco-evolutionary interactions into account, such as evolution of plasticity or an interaction between species sorting and evolution. And so then based on this framework, we basically then constructed eco-evolutionary partitioning metrics. And now I would like to just highlight you some of these approaches. So one of the approaches that um, I basically developed is, is called the reaction norm approach and is based on reaction norms um, that were introduced by Richard Walterick. And so this um, approach allows you to disentangle your population trait change from one or from your population at time point one in a specific environment to your population at time point two in the other environment. So basically here one assumes that your population experience a change in environment and that you are able to measure um, individuals of your population at these two time points also in the two different environmental conditions. And then a change in environment would basically induce a phenotypic plasticity response in your population at time point one. The rest of the trade change would be evolution. However, if no evolution of plasticity occurred, this would mean that your population at the second time point would basically have the same plasticity response of your population at the first time point. So any deviation in this um, plasticity response gives you an idea of evolution of plasticity. And then our other part is just mean trait evolution. If you then paste some um, variables on this, you can basically reconstruct this equation. We then used this approach on a natural Daphnia magna population that experienced a change in fish predation pressure from no fish to high fish to um, reduced fish predation pressure. And so we uh, applied this approach on 14 life history, morphological and behavioral traits. And we mainly found um, large contributions of um, phenotypic plasticity. However, when we compared the two transition periods um, from the pre-fish to high fish or from the high fish to the reduced fish, then we found in the first transition larger contributions of, oops, of evolution of plasticity and in the second period larger contributions of mean trait evolution. And so then in the next step we basically extended this approach to the community level. So here you need um, reaction norms of each of your species in the community and then you can really um, already evaluate um, the different components of the eco evo sandwich. So we have plasticity, mean trait evolution, and species sorting, and also our eco-evo interactions. Now, a second metric I would like to highlight is the price equation. So the price equation doesn't necessarily use this information on reaction norms, but it rather um, uses information on relative abundances and trait values of your different genotypes at the different um, time points. And so here, you really need to be able to track your different genotypes. And then it allows you to disentangle your community trade change into a species sorting component, genotype sorting component, and trade change within genotypes. And then at the very last, what we basically found is when we um, compared these two equations mathematically, is that we basically could combine them and then really um, disentangle all these different components. So here you need information on um, trade values and relative abundances of your genotypes in the two environments so that you have reaction norms for each of your genotypes. Now what I basically want to um, highlight with this is that these um, eco-evolutionary partitioning metrics can basically be used to already start um, tracking or um, evaluating um, the different fundamental processes and how they might contribute to your community trade change. So we can um, easily if, uh, um, see already our species sorting component, the genotype sorting, which might be related to selection. And then we have trade change within genotypes, which might be due to mutations. So here I make a very um, simplified assumption that it's maybe only mutation, but of course also phenotypic plasticity um, could um, be included in this term. But that means that we also still have some other components that still remain like the gene flow, dispersal speciation, but also genetic drift and ecological drift. And so we could assume that gene flow, dispersal and speciation, basically um, they result in new genotypes in your population or they result in new species in your community. 
while with genetic drift and ecological drift, we could see it as random losses of genotypes or random losses of species. And so this basically means that if we look at our community trait change, um, we could um, partition it in a trait change over the shared species in our community and a trait change that um, evaluates the species that are gained and a trait change that evaluates the species that were lost of your community. So in this case, um, your orange species might be um, new due to speciation um, and your blue species would enter the community via dispersal. So both of these terms could be evaluated in the species gain. Then uh, the purple species might get randomly lost for your community and this could be due to ecological drift. So this shows basically that these partitioning metrics can really um, allow you to incorporate these different fundamental processes and might allow you to evaluate how relatively important these processes are. Now, obviously, we can do this um, for or extend this to our genotypes within species within our community. And then we can also get our processes of gene flow and genetic drift in there. Now, um, I want to keep on focusing on eco-evolutionary partitioning metrics. And so basically, um, more specifically on extension to spatial study systems. And so why I think um, this is important is because many um, eco-evolutionary dynamics basically focus on temporal trait change, while there also exist many studies that look at um, trait variation in spatial landscapes. And so it's really important, um, or there's a really difference between spatial study systems and temporal study systems, because in temporal study systems, you really have your trait change from one time point, how it changes to the next, and how it changes to um, the most recent time point. So there's a very clear um, direction in how your traits change. Well, if you compare a, a landscape where you have different trait distributions at different locations, so this is often a snapshot in time, and here you don't necessarily have a clear direction between the trait shift you observe in your landscape. And if we then look back at our partitioning metrics, so here the price equation, then what we often see is that we have information at time point two minus time point one, time point two minus time point one, time point two minus time point one. So this really evaluates your trait change from the most recent time point to the oldest time point. So there's a clear, um, so your time point one is often used as a reference to see how traits change. In a spatial setting, you could look at how your traits um, change from your uh, location two compared to your location one, but you could also just do the other way around, compare how location one differs from location two. And so if we then look at our price equation and either use um, site one as a reference or site two as a reference, then the purple boxes basically indicate terms that are similar, just a change in the sign. But what we actually observe is that um, they are multiplied either with the trade value at site two or the trait value at site one. And so this means that um, the eco-evolutionary contributions you would find from these equations would differ depending on if you use site one and site or site two as a reference. And basically to just um, put this as a main message, partitioning metrics, most of them depend on the direction of your trade change. And to make it um, very extreme, so in these cases, without going into much detail on the slide, so in these cases with the reaction norm approach and price reaction norm equation, when we compare population uh, two with population one, we find 60% evolution. However, when we compare population one to population two, we find 100% evolution. And so depending on how much you like evolution, you might choose the one or the other direction. But of course, that's not um, the idea. Now, what I also want to show you is that some spatial study systems do imply a direction of the trade change. And so this is um, studies that have information on the invasion history or basically use a space for time substitution. And so this study by Etterson and Shaw basically um, looks at the North American prairie plant and how it would change under um, environmental change scenarios. So they started um, or they used the Minnesota population as the ancestral state. And then um, the population in Oklahoma was basically the derived state. And so this means that um, these um, kind of setups and studies 
have a clear direction of their trade change. And so we could use um, current partition metrics basically to quantify um, the contributions of plasticity and evolution to these expected trade responses in this um, plant species. And so when we did this, um, we basically can calculate different contribution of plasticity, mean trade evolution and evolution of plasticity. So this is just to show you that it's not all spatial study systems um, have no direction in their trade chains, but um, most of them do. So then what if we cannot imply a direction in our trade change? So um, we basically came up with um, different ways to extend partitioning metrics to spatial study systems. As you will see um, very soon, they're very um, straightforward extensions and maybe a bit too straightforward. But this is also, I think, um, the first step to basically start thinking on how can we use current methods to um, spatial study systems. And so in a very first um, way is when you have, for example, five different um, locations um, and you need and you do not have this common reference point, you can basically create a reference point by calculating uh, a group mean and then using current partitioning metrics to calculate deviations from this group mean. As a second way, um, you can basically calculate um, both directions. So if you cannot choose a direction, you just um, take two sides you're interested in and you just calculate both directions and take the average of both components. A third way, which is probably more interesting, is basically trying to modify partitioning metrics mathematically to become independent of the reference. So now we have these three ways. How do they also um, differ? So um, basically, we can look at the outcome of the metric if the components still sum up to the observed trade change and if they relate to a common reference. So for our group mean, um, so here we basically calculate ecological and evolutionary contributions or deviations from this group mean. And so we can both look at absolute and relative um, contributions. They do sum up to the observed trade change. And they also have a common reference because you just basically constructed this group mean that you then used as the same reference for all your populations. But your results also depend on this. If you choose a different reference, you might get different um, contributions, but the relative contributions between the populations should stay the same. Then for the both directions, so here, because you basically calculate the direction um, in one, or you calculate the components in one direction, then the other, and you basically average them, um, or you average, or you take the average of the absolute values of the components, you can basically only look at the relative contributions. They also do not sum up anymore to the observed trade change because you took average of absolute values. And they also don't have a common reference because um, you just calculated between pairs. And so each time the reference changes. And then the very last, um, modify the metric. So here again, you can um, look at absolute and relative contributions. They do sum up to the observed trade change, but they also don't have a common reference because it's each time um, calculated between pairs of population. Now you might wonder why am I doing this? Why am I interested in finding ways on how to um, extend partitioning metrics to spatial study systems. And so what I would like to show you very briefly is this study um, on zooplankton communities, which the data was collected by Sarah Rousseau. So basically we had information on 20 ponds in Belgium, um, where we had 14 environmental variables or information on 14 uh, environmental variables. We had information on the zooplankton community composition. We also had a common garden data on regional trade values of abundant taxa and local trade values of Daphne magna. And we also had neutral molecular markers in Daphne magna. So we had basically a lot of information. Now together with Jelena Pantel, what we did is we calculated the impact of local evolution to community trade change for each of these um, sites and for three different traits. And so this um, map gives you basically a spatial landscape of the impact of local evolution to community trade change. And so now you can see that for some uh, sites, the local impact is um, very high for all three traits, while for other sites, maybe it's only for two or for one or even um, low impact for all three traits. And so this is really interesting because now we can really start um, seeing where evolution might be important in a spatial landscape. 
And then in the next step, what we did is basically trying to explain this variation in or impact of um, evolution by looking at um, landscape properties. So we looked at the environmental divergence of sites. We also looked at population properties, so population genetic distance within population gene diversity. And we also looked at community properties, so the species diversity of the non daphne magna community and the difference, so how much um, local Daphne Magna trade values differed from the non Daphne Magna community trade values. And so what we found when we put this in a regression model, we basically found that the community properties were the ones that explained the impact of local evolution. And so this is actually a really nice example of eco-evolutionary dynamics in a spatial landscape, showing that the impact of local evolution for community trade change basically dependent on community properties. And so I think this is really a, a cool example that shows how these spatial partition metrics can be implemented or why they are relevant to start really exploring this eco-evo landscapes. So to get back to our three modifications, so I will not go into detail how the first one or the second one goes because these are really straightforward. You either calculate a group mean or you just um, calculate both directions. What I would like to highlight um, is maybe going uh, in this third modification, how can we modify partitioning metrics to become independent of our reference point? And so in our case, um, if we look at the price equation at the population level, so here, these um, are frequency changes of our genotypes, trade changes within our genotypes. So what we can see is that these Q2 minus Q1, Q1 minus Q2 is basically the same. There's just a shift in the sign, but they differ in the multiplication with the trade value. Now, if we just take the average of this trade value, then it doesn't matter which um, reference we take because this average will be the same and this will just decide whether it's plus or minus. So then we can do the same for the second component so again, we just, it differs just in its multiplication with the relative abundance. If we take the average, then basically it becomes independent of this reference. And so this is a, a mathematically modified version of the price equation that can quantify genotype sorting and trade shifts within genotypes, but doesn't necessarily depend on, I go from site one to site two or from site two to site one. Now for the reaction norm approach, we also wanted to do something similar. And so we played with um, this idea, uh, if we take average of our components. However, when we did so for plasticity and the mean trade evolution, we basically found that they equal to each other. And so here, in this case, this averaging ID was not such a good ID because it meant that for any system, if you would use this modification, it means plasticity and mean trade evolution is always the same, which is, of course, um, nonsensical. However, there were some people um, a bit smarter than us, most likely, so that already had um, used a reaction norm approach or had already used an approach based on reaction norms, which is the Geber method. And so this method um, allows you to quantify an average plasticity component and an average evolution component, and it is independent of the reference. However, it does not include this um, evolution of plasticity component, which we had in the reaction norm approach. Okay. And with this, um, I talked a bit faster, um, I realized than, than I normally do. So we are already at the take home messages of um, this presentation. So basically um, what I showed you, I showed um, in the beginning, I started with this conceptual framework that really um, goes or starts from the fundamental processes of evolutionary biology and community ecology and how basically starting to look at um, interactions between these processes might help us um, to gain a more mechanistic understanding of eco-evolutionary dynamics in a multi-species setting. Then um, obviously now um, we can do follow-up theoretical models where we include these interactions, um, also experimental designs. And I basically showed you how um, partitioning metrics can allow us to include these fundamental processes and quantify how relatively important they are in the dynamic under study. And then I also show you that um, most of these partitioning metrics basically depend on directionality and so therefore they might um, be less uh, suitable for undirected trade shifts. 
I showed you some easy extensions um, of these metrics, but I would also be happy to hear your thoughts on it if um, to basically if there are other extensions that we can consider or other approaches to really um, evaluate trade variation in spatial landscapes. Um, and so by using these partitioning metrics, we can really start to evaluate um, spatial landscape of eco-evolutionary dynamics and start to identify hotspots and cold spots of um, eco-evo interactions. And so with this, I would like to thank you for your attention. I would also like to thank um, the funding I received during my PhD postdoc um, and also now the IGB for um, offering me this opportunity um, to really um, create my research group. Um, and with this, I'm happy to take um, questions. Thank you very much, Lynn, for your really nice talk. Um, are there any questions? So you can either ask in the chat if you like, I will try to keep an eye on that. Mm -hmm. And um, if you like, you can also unmute yourself and um, ask a question for Lynn. Yeah, when I practiced it, it was 45 minutes. <laughs> no, that's actually good because we have more time for discussion. And um, yeah, I said before that um, some of us might have to disappear due to um, bureaucratic meeting. So <laughs> you will allow me to enjoy the full length of this meeting, maybe. <laughs> so um, I do have a question. Um, when you look at um, your metrics, mm -hmm. um, do you think um, there is a way to couple these metrics with um, modeling methods that are uh, based, for example, on um, adaptive dynamics. So there are um, these um, really, uh, there's this big class of models um, around adaptive dynamics where mm -hmm. you mostly look at phenotypic evolution, but I think the idea is um, in a similar spirit that you um, try to understand how um, evolutionary processes might influence ecology? Yeah, so with these metrics, so the metrics basically um, what they need, well, I don't have to show them, um, what they need is they need um, data. So you could couple them with a model where you basically collect um, the necessary data that you can feed in the equations and then see if basically the models you process are also tracked back by the equation. Mm -hmm. um, I did not, I know there is, um, a continuous version of the price equation that might be used in theoretical models. Um, so that would be a different way if you can make these equations more um, dynamically to try to incorporate them into models. But so far I haven't tried um, that. So how I see it more, that's maybe also more from the empirical side is you collect data. So you either do that using experiments or you do it via theoretical models and you feed it in these equations to um, identify how important these processes are. Mm -hmm. um. uh, okay. <laughs> I think there was a message for you that actually went to me. So someone um, in the audience um, actually congratulates for your talk and says you should never apologize for finishing early. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. Okay, I won't. <laughs> no, no, definitely not. So um, when you um, explain that um, there is um, this um, problem with a difference in sign when you um, compare the direction of trade changes, um, could you say a bit more um, how you try to address this with your mathematical modification? I have to admit that I'm a bit too uh, slow. <laughs> so uh, no, that no. was, I think, in your part on, on spatial models. Yeah, so I think this slide is actually good then maybe to show it. Mm -hmm. Because so with the mathematical modification, so the first two are very straightforward, right? And are a bit boring. Like in the sense, you just calculate a mean and then you calculate, um, use partition metrics to calculate ecological and evolutionary deviations from this mean. So this mean is basically your time point one and then each of the sites is your next time point. Mm -hmm. With the pairwise directions, it's just also, you calculate one direction, the other, so that's quite um, uh, trivial. But then with the, the basically, um, trying to identify why these equations depend on the direction, 
um, was really starting. So if you write them down, if you go from your population one to two or from two to one with the price equation, you can basically see, so we have said two is your trade value at of your population two times basically the relative abundance at time point two minus relative abundance at time point one. If you look at, if you go from population two to one, then you have your trade value at time of your population one, mm -hmm. and then your relative abundance of population one minus your relative abundance of population two. So these two terms is Q2 minus Q1 or Q1 minus Q2. So they will either just flip the sign. Either one is bigger than the other one or it's the other way around. So these are basically the same. It only differs in this uh, multiplication of the trade value. And so here, if you want to make it independent of the reference, then it's here that you need to find a way to change it because this is already doing the same. It's just a flip in the sign. And so that's why we thought, ah, maybe if we take the average of the two populations we are comparing, then it doesn't matter if you go from population one or two, you will always find this average. Here you will either have Q2 minus Q1 or Q1 minus Q2. So it will just be a plus or negative, but it's still um, the same contribution you will find. So you basically make it symmetric and then... Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. Because with the uh, reaction norm approach, I basically call the Geber method the symmetric version of the reaction norm approach. And uh, the version that I developed is basically the asymmetric version, because it depends if you go from one population or the other. So yeah. So um, when you are able to um, quantify in a yeah, given community what the relative contributions um, of the different processes are, how could you um, apply that? So how could you, um, in a way, um, learn something about um, how um, the community might be managed in a good way? Oh, um, you mean like with thinking about conservation? Management? Yeah, for example, so if you... Um, so that is, I think, a difficult question because also, <laughs> <laughs> I think one, because we don't have enough experiments or maybe we do have already quite some models, um, but I think we need more first information on if we have the data, put them in the equation, what comes out and mm -hmm. how does that link to specific um, properties of the, of the system you are investigating, right? Yeah. And I think when we have that information, we might start asking ah, if we see a lot of species sorting going on, maybe there's a lot of invasive species entering the system or there is a huge turnover in species migrating, something like that. If we see a lot of evolution going on, maybe it's just the local community staying, but they're just evolving to the changing conditions. And so maybe that's based on how to inform how the system is doing. But I think there, to my knowledge at this point, there's not yet a community study that really tracks all the species abundances, then all the phenotypic trade changes, um, and if there is, then I would really like to yeah. collaborate with them to see if we can actually use these equations to find something um, meaningful. Um, yeah, I think um, to me, I think it, as far as I know, it, it is very difficult to um, disentangle and, and uh, combine these uh, processes anyway. So um, I have a question from the audience now. Um, Karen Patney um, would like to know, from your experience in working with eco-evolutionary dynamics, what pairwise effect do you find is the most commonly observed? So um, you listed a few processes. So which of the processes seems to be most common or most important? Okay, yeah. Um, so this is basically on the interactions between fundamental processes, right? Um, yes. So, so the problem is that we didn't do so we didn't do a systematic um, meta analysis or so we basically don't know what I can say is that it was more difficult to find studies that looked at interactions between genetic and ecological drift. Um, 
So I think I can more say what I didn't find immediately evidence of rather than when what I found a lot of evidence of. Because if I found an example, I basically was, okay, we have an example um, because the study was more to bring conceptual um, ideas rather than really giving an overview which process is the most important. But I think this is the next logical step to do, right? But how, I think it will be a lot of work to evaluate all the studies that might potentially include uh, these specific interactions. Mm -hmm. um, but so, and then, yeah, so you have also, you can also look at existing frameworks already like this evolving meta community. We know more or less which um, processes they focus. Then you also have um, the geographic mosaic of theory, which basically looks a lot at um, the evolutionary processes interacting with species sorting. Um, so we have some existing frameworks and from those we can we know which processes they incorporate so i think that can also give us evidence of what is lacking um, and what is already well explored but i think now who would be like to to see if specific interactions always result in the same eco evo dynamics um, if yes then that could give us some idea of making predictions if no then well we tried right <laughs> Karen, does that kind of answer your question? All right, so um, Chris Knight, you have uh, raised your hand. Hi, uh, yeah, I just, uh, thank you very much, that's, that's great. I wanted to ask a bit about how, I mean, what would be your optimal data set? What would be the, the how, what are the things which you don't see in the literature that we, that, I don't know, I as an experimentalist should be trying to get hold of to fit these models and should we be working for the most complex communities we can or the simplest communities we can or what what are the what what are the optimal data for your for the this kind of partitioning approaches yeah so basically i'm not sure am i yeah i'm still sharing right um so this was basically the the grand work of my phd so i would always say try to collect all this data but this is a huge lot of work because you need like to be able to track your genotypes within your species over time, then also do common gardens at specific moments. So this gets a lot of work. So either you, you are not able to track your genotypes. I think that is often most common that you cannot track your genotypes. Then I would say um, go to this reaction norm approach where you just need individuals of your specific species that basically represent your species at that time and you substitute them in these common garden environments. So this common garden is basically, in these two environments, it's basically just to get your plasticity component from your evolution. That's basically it. If you say common gardens is also impossible to do, but you just cancel out plasticity. Um, I think you also cancel out evolution of plasticity and you basically get um, more to like this version of the, mm, no, it will not be this version. You will just get a species sorting component, a trade change component, and an interaction between species sorting and trade change. But also already this is, I think, valuable to do because we, I have a feeling that we don't know so much about how these processes change over time and how they also interact. And so I also know there is like this, a lot of plant studies that look at um, species turnover and intraspecific trait variation over an environmental gradient. And then they calculate basically this regression models with a different type of community weighted means. And they say, um, using then regression sum of squares, they can say, ah, this process is important over this environmental gradient. But for this approach, you always need this environmental gradient. While these reactional approaches would just allow you to calculate each of the contributions already. And then you could still link it to an environmental gradient if you want, but you could also just see how they change over time. Mm -hmm. So if you can track genotypes, try this <laughs> if you can't. Yeah, I mean, I guess I'm sorry. I, I guess I was thinking towards microbial data where we're actually very good at tracking genotypes, mm -hmm. uh, but we're not very good at, at having um, uh, individual trait values yeah. for, uh, for individual species. Yeah, so that might be a bit more tricky. So, so I also like when I was scanning the literature, microbial systems seems a very good opportunity because they are easy to gather the species and are easy to gather the genotypes, but the links to the traits was then more difficult because I found a lot of studies that I was like, ah, oh, yes, species abundances, ah, oh, yes, genotype abundance, and then where's the trait? Um, so I think that's, yeah. 
So if there is a solution for that, then then we're good. I yeah. think. No, I mean, if your if your trait becomes something that you can measure with single cell sorting or something, then maybe we stand a chance. But yeah. But even I don't know if it needs to be on the single cell level. Maybe if you also have your individuals of your species that represent your species and just in the common garden. I don't know. I don't work so. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe, maybe there are traits that are sort of interest that we can get out of genome data. I don't know. Um, yeah, or um, I think the easy trait that they often also look at is the growth rates of the bacteria, but then you have to think if that doesn't confound too much with using also abundance. Yeah. Because it's also the same with the density. And, yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Are there any more questions? But I don't see anything anymore in the chat and uh, no one has raised their hand last chance. <laughs> if not, um, I would like to thank all of you for coming and um, I would like to thank Lynn for giving such a really nice talk. And um, yeah, all the best. See you all next week. Yes, thank you all for joining. Bye bye. It was fun. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Bye.